Welcome back everyone to our lecture series on linear algebra based upon the textbook linear algebra done openly. As usual, I'm your professor, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. It's great to have you here today. Uh, today we're going to talk about section 4.7, uh, which is entitled the Graham-Smith algorithm. Now the Graham-Smith algorithm, or sometimes called the, the Graham-Smith process, is a way of constructing an orthogonal basis. Uh, the orthogonal projections and the like that we've talked about previously in this section, like the Fourier coefficients and what have you, uh, typically depended upon having an orthogonal basis. It turns out that using the idea of orthogonal projections, we can actually construct an orthogonal basis given any basis of a subspace. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a basis. If we have a spanning set, we can construct an orthogonal basis using this Graham-Smith process. Then when we're done uh, with constructing an orthogonal basis, if we want an orthonormal basis, we can normalize each of the vectors uh, to make them univectors. Now, some people present the Graham-Smith algorithm as normalizing along the way. I don't really see a need of doing that initially. We can always normalize when we're done. And the Graham-Smith process, it actually constructs the ortho orthogonal basis in a recursive manner. And so let's explain what we mean by that. So suppose we have already in hand a basis for our vector space W that sits inside of Fn. And so what we're going to do is recursively create a basis that's orthogonal in the following manner. Well, if that basis is empty, then, well, we're already done. We don't need to do anything about that because the empty basis is a orthogonal basis for the trivial subspace. Uh, but for a positive dimensional vector space, we're going to take, we already have the basis x1, x2 up to xp. And so we're not going to do anything to to the first vector. V1, which would be the new basis that we're forming, we'll just take that to be x1, no change whatsoever. Uh, but for V2, what we're going to do is we're going to take the current x2 and we're going to subtract from it v1 dot x2 over v1 dot v1 times v1. That is, we take the orthogonal projection of x2 onto v1 and we subtract it from x2. And this is going to have the consequence that the new vector v1 will be orthogonal to the previous vector v1. Uh, so the current vector v2 will be orthogonal to the v1 using this orthogonal projection projectionality. And then for v3, we do the same thing. We're going to take the current x3. We're going to subtract from it the orthogonal projection of x3 onto v1 and the orthogonal projection of x3 into uh, onto v2. And when we do these together in tandem, this is the orthogonal projection into the subspace spanned by v1 and v2 of the vector x3. And so this new vector v3 will be orthogonal to the vectors x, uh, to the vectors v1 and v3, v2, excuse me. And so then we just replicate, we repeat this process over and over and over again recursively. V4 will be x4 subtract the orthogonal projection of x4 onto v1, v2, v3. X5, sorry, V5 will just be X5 subtract the orthogonal projection of X5 onto V1, V2, V3, V4. And we keep on repeating this over and over and over again until we get to the last vector, VP, for which we take XP, subtract from it, the orthogonal projection of XP onto V1, the orthogonal projection of XP onto V2, onto V3, onto V4, all the way down to VP minus 1. All right. And so uh, we do this step by step by step. And so each step along the way, we're, we're, at, we're replacing a, an X with a vector V, which will be orthogonal to all the previous Vs. And we're going to have the property that every time we replace a vector V, sorry, we replace a vector X with a vector V, we don't change the span. So if we go from 1 up to K, 1 up to K, we don't change the span of the original set x1 up to xk, but we are replacing with orthogonal counterparts. And the basic idea is the following. x1 and v1 are the same vector, so interchanging them does nothing. Um, if you replace v2 
but that is if you replace x2 with v2, well, notice that v2 is just x2 minus some multiple of v1. Since we have a v1, you could replace that away and you get back the original x2. And so when we come to v3, uh, v3 is inside the span of x3, v1, and v2, which by mathematical induction, we know will have the same span as the previous ones. So v3 doesn't add anything new, but if we use v3 instead, we could reconstruct uh, we can reconstruct x3 using v3 and combinations of v1 and v2. So by induction, this doesn't change the spanning set whatsoever. So let's show you an example of how this process works in practice. So take the following three vectors, x1, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, x2, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, and x3, which is 0, 0, 1, 1. And this, is a, this will form a subspace of R4, that is, W is the span of x1, x2, x3. If we apply the Gram-Smith process to that, what do we get? Well, the Gram-Smith process will reproduce the exact same basis if these vectors are already orthogonal, but a quick check shows that they're not orthogonal. Um, if we take x1 and x2 together, the dot product is 3. x1 and x3 gives us a dot product of 2. And then x2 and x3 gives us a dot product of 2 again. So these things are not orthogonal. So step one of Gram-Smith is pretty easy. You just take V1 to equal X1. You don't change anything, so just get 1, 1, 1, 1 here. Make no changes whatsoever. Um, for V2, what we're going to do is we're going to take X2 and we subtract from it V1 dot X2 over V1 dot V1 and times that by X1. V1, V1, excuse me. So let's see the details of that. So the original X2 is 0, 1, 1, 1. And so if we take the dot product of V1 and X2, X2 is the vector you see uh, just drawn right there. And then V1 is still just X1. If we take the dot product of those, we're going to get a 3. And if you take the dot product of V1 with itself, you get a 4. And we're going to times that by 1, 1, 1, 1, V1 there. And so when we combine those together, you're going to end up with 0 minus 3 fourths. So you get three-fourths right there. Uh, you're going to get one minus three-fourths, which is just a one-fourth. And then that actually happens with all the other coefficients as well. So you get three-fourths, one-fourth, one-fourth, and one-fourth. And that should be a negative three-fourths at the top there. Sorry about that. Uh, and so that gives us a vector which is going to be orthogonal to the original one. Notice now if you take v1 dot this v2, You'll get negative three-fourths plus a fourth plus a fourth plus a fourth. That gives you zero. Now, if you are completely abhorrent to all fractions, uh, the ratiophobic amongst us might be panicked here. Be aware that you could notice there's a common factor of one-fourth. If you were to scale that out, the one-fourth, uh, you get negative three, one, 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 like so. And this vector, negative 3, 1, 1, 1, is still orthogonal to V1. Um, we're going to get still negative 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 if we take the dot product. And as scalar multiples don't change, they don't change um, the span whatsoever, we actually could get rid of the 1 fourth and just take V2 to be this vector right here. Negative 1, 1, 1, 1. We're going to normalize all these vectors in the end. So it doesn't really matter what scalar multiple you do. If you prefer the integers, uh, that's perfectly fine. I do too. I'm not afraid of them. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think integer arithmetic is a little bit easier than, than working with fractions. So we're going to use uh, we're gonna use negative 3, 1, 1, 1 for our V2. All right? So how do we do V3 then? So we're going to take X3. Whoops. Uh, we're going to take X3, which remember that was the vector 0, 0, 1, 1. We're going to subtract from it v1 dot x3. Uh, so x3 is the vector I just wrote down there. v1 was all 1s. So you take the dot product, you get 2. This will sit over 4. And you times that by 1, 1, 1, 1. All right? And then we have to subtract from this also v2, which as we mentioned before, v2 is now going to be negative 3, 1, 1, 1. But we have to compute the Fourier coefficients. All right. Uh, if you take v2 dot x3, 
you end up with a two. Um, if you take v, if you take a v two dot v two, you're gonna get a nine plus one plus one plus one. That's a twelve. Sits in the bottom. Now this, these numbers will be a little bit different if you had uh, used the original v one v two we had this one right here. But the thing is. We can scale this because these Fourier coefficients will correct any scalar multiplication we have there. That's why I'm, I'm perfectly happy using integers. Uh, let's simplify some of the fractions because uh, after all, uh, one half, uh, one, one, the, the two fourths is the same thing as one half. And the two twelfths, we can make that become a one sixth. And so adding everything together for the first component, we are going to get 0 minus 1 half. Uh, we're then going to get plus 3 sixth. And I'm going to help us out there. Uh, let's see. 3 sixths, of course, is 1 half. 0 minus a half plus a half is 0. We like zeros. Uh, for the second component, we still get a 0. We're going to get a negative 1 half. And this time we're going to get a minus one sixth. And so I would need to write the, this one half here. Like I said, we're afraid of fractions. This should be three sixth. So this will all add up together to be negative four sixth or negative two thirds. And then the, the third component is going to be one minus a half minus a sixth. So this is going to take the negative two thirds we had before, but we're adding one to it. So we get a positive one third. And then the last component is the exact same thing. So uh, we get another one third as well. And so this is our vector V3. If you don't like the fractions, again, we could factor out the one third. So we get zero, negative two, one, and one. And so then we could just take V3 to be that scalar multiple, 0, negative 2, 1, and 1, like so. And if you check with the previous vectors, if you take uh, if you take V3 dot V1, remember V1 was the all ones vector, so you're going to get 0, negative 2, plus 1, plus 1, that's a 0. And if you take V3 dot V2, which is up here, negative 3, 1, 1, 1, uh, what you're going to see happening there is you're going to get negative 2 plus 1 plus 1. So that's also orthogonal. So these three vectors are now orthogonal. And so this is our new basis, C. We didn't change the first vector at all, the all ones vector. Uh, the second vector was then negative 3, 1, 1, 1. And then the last one we just got was 0, negative 2, 1, and 1. And so this provides now an orthogonal basis. An orthogonal basis for the original vector space W. We did not change the vector space. We just changed uh, that we now have an orthogonal basis, for which then we can do all the cool things with an orthogonal basis. Uh, for this vector space now. So we can always create an orthogonal basis if we need one. Now, this is if we want an orthogonal basis. And we also chose this so they're all integer numbers there. If we want, if we want an orthonormal basis, uh, then remember the idea is we need to uh, we need to normalize everything. So we could take u1 to be the normalization of v1. So one, 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 one. The length of that vector is going to be the square root of four. So we get the vector of all one halves. For the second one, we want to normalize that. So we take the vector, what did we have before? Uh, negative three, one, one, one. And we actually calculated the length of this thing early, remember? Because uh, when we were doing the Fourier coefficients, we had to do v2 dot v2, uh, which gave us the 12. Uh, well, now we just take the square root of that. 
which of course, if you want to, if you want, you can rewrite the the square root of twelve as just um, two root three. I, I don't know if that's necessarily simpler. I, I'm perfectly happy with the square root of twelve in the denominator there. So you two, we're going to get negative three over the square root of twelve, one over the square root of twelve, one over the square root of twelve, and one over the square root of twelve. So that's our second vector there. And then for the third one, just normalizing this thing, u3, the vector we had was 0, negative 2, 1, 1. And so if we calculate its norm, we're going to get 4 plus 1 plus 1, which is 6, square root of 6 in the bottom. And again, just leave them. I, you don't need to rationalize the denominator. That's a silly thing that people tell us that never really gives a good reason. Negative 2 over the square root of 6, 1 over the square root of 6. And one of the square root of six. So with these vectors in mind, we now have an orthonormal basis. Um, if we take if we take the set u1, u2, and u3, this is now an orthonormal an orthonormal basis for w. So if we have a basis for any subspace, we can construct an orthogonal basis and then an orthonormal basis from that. And like I said, uh, if, if you just have a spanning set, this process will automatically prune down that spanning set when you form the orthogonal basis. It'll, whenever you have a vector you didn't need, um, it'll actually produce a zero and just throw it out of the process.